off top, the Dallas Mavericks are named the Dallas Mavericks because of the TV show, the TV Western Maverick. Fans chose that name because they sent in 4,600 postcards beating potential names of Wranglers and the Express. Mm. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show. All right, welcome to the Dominique Foxworth Show. We are joined by apparently art connoisseur, (laughs) (laughs) Wozni Lambrey, and of course, always joined by the great Charlie Kravitz from his wonderful D.C. uh, estate. The snack is here. What's up, Waz? Thanks for joining us, man. Appreciate it. I know it's not as much of a sacrifice because you're on the West Coast, but you are a Hall of Famer, so we knew who to call in. But when we needed a sacrifice for the Dominique Foxworth show, someone stay up late and watch this basketball game. Thank you, man. And I would say the only thing I'm a connoisseur of really is the food and cuisine of Jamaica. That's it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's I don't know. It. You, you every every week, every time I talk to you, you add a new frame to the wall behind you. You got that big. I, I mean, that's probably <laughs> something famous. That if I would have stayed awake in art history at Maryland, I would know what uh, that is a print of. But it looked like some fancy European. Yeah, I, I I took it off of one of the rich houses in my neighborhood. Like you know, they always put stuff out that they don't want when they're remodeling and stuff like that. And like that's where I do my working out at, like that part of my neighborhood. And I put it in my trunk. But I'm sure it's just a replica though. It's nothing crazy. Oh yeah, yeah, no, nah, no. Nah. It, it, it looks. They important. wouldn't have no, been putting it out for us poor's yeah. to have some. If <laughs> Char- it was Charlie knows magic. what it is. Charlie recognized it. Yeah, it, it looks like it's a brutalist painting of Rudy Gobert. <laughs> <laughs> this guy. <laughs> this All right. guy. He wants to talk about basketball. Yes. The the half of basketball that we watched. I don't know. I was done with this game at the half. We watched into the third before we started recording because Charlie is a coward and he didn't want us to, um, I guess he's responsible. He didn't want us to record. And then there'd be some never happened before miraculous comeback. But I mean, I took that all my notes and all my stats and all of my opinions are based on what I saw in the first half. So yeah. whatever happened after that was irrelevant. Yeah, it was a beat down. And I mean, that's where mm-hmm. we have to start. Like yeah. Luca came out 20 points in the first quarter. He Ooh. really, Crazy. Stepped on him and held him down Luke and legend. took all of the life out of the building. And I want to ask you guys, so coming off that game, what was the, what's the story for you guys? Is it, is it Luca and the Mavs? Is it Kyrie's offense? Is it the Wolves listless offense? I, I think for me, it's this idea that, you know, we were in this new NBA where young teams and teams that have never done it before, you know, who are led by guys that have never done it, lost these kinds of playoff series, can come in and do it. That's what I was thinking after the Nuggets series because I, like an idiot, picked the Wolves to win this thing in seven because they had home court advantage. And I think throughout the first three losses of the series where they lost it down the stretch and they lost it basically because they didn't play smart, they didn't play like, sorry, veteran late in basketball um like i realized i was wrong to to think that to go against our priors um of you know 75 years or whatever it is of nba history where these young teams these up and coming teams have to sort of go through the crucible and i think we saw the wolves hit their wall and they just didn't have mm-hmm. it in terms of execution uh in order to get to the nba finals yeah it seems it felt like before this series started it was kind of accepted because the Wolves got past Denver that they were a better team. And because we were slow to acknowledge Dallas, it was kind of accepted that the Wolves were going to win this series or at least give them a fight. But nothing has seemed more obvious in this whole playoffs than how outmatched they were in this because the offense, it was bad. And I, it's been mediocre. We've talked about this on this show a bunch before. That Wolves offense has been mediocre through the season, uh, like middle of the pack as far as ratings concerned. And at times in the Denver series, it was just flat out bad. But that's what the problem was to me. It's like they feel, and in comparison to what the Mavs are doing, that offense just feels like it doesn't have any answers. There's no motion. There's, there's no comfort. And for, and for Ant to get going, it feels like he has to work so hard to get a shot off at this point in the playoffs. You can't expect that out of anybody, especially not out of someone who uh, is as explosive as Ant and requires as much athleticism as he does. 
You know, it's funny because yesterday on NBA group chat, me and the homies were trying to come up with, oh, maybe the Wolves might have found something in playing slow-mo, and he did a good job against Luka, and maybe slow-mo is the answer. And, you know, quickly we realized in this game that that wasn't the case. They were loading up on Ant. They basically weren't guarding slow-mo, and every now and again he'd get the ball kicked to him for a wide-open three-point and be a record scratch. He'd give it up. Yeah. He wouldn't take the shot. He wouldn't drive. And I thought Nas Reed even had some moments where he had an open look. Or Conley had some moments where, you know, the only person that could generate anything seemed to be Ant. And Dallas was loading up on him. And they were even zoning up at certain points um, on his drive. Like, it looked like there was just four guys in his headspace uh, every time he tried to do something going towards the cup. Anytime he set a screen, it was like, all right, you're just bringing an extra defender into the action. Because they're going to yeah. beg you to give it to somebody else, and it just didn't work. Was are you surprised by, you know, we, we watched that Denver Wolves series, and Minnesota had no issue with Murray. And because of that, they were able to speed Jokic up, get him out of his rhythm as, you know, the preeminent basketball creator on earth right now. Are you surprised how much they struggled to sort of get Luka and Kyrie off the pace that they play at? I mean, Luca specifically, I'm not just because the guy is a bear of a man. Like, he's so big. And even when mm -hmm. you bring length on him, if that guy with the length doesn't have the heft to deal with Luca's strength, um, it's not going to matter. The length isn't going to bother him. So Jaden McDaniels is one of the best perimeter defenders in the NBA. That's just a truth. And Luca just wasn't bothered. They could never bother him. They could never speed him up. They could never get him out of his rhythm. Um, There was nobody. Ant couldn't do it. Slow-mo had a little nice moment. Even, like, you know, if you were on Twitter or whatever, some of the numbers circulating of when Ant was guarding Luca, what the shot percentages were. If you went back and watched them, they were good shots that Luca makes all the time. They were good shots, a.k.a. that he made in this game. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so, yeah. yeah, they just didn't have the defensive end answers for Luca. Luca was out of his mind. Obviously, he shot um I think 62% from 3 in the first half. And yeah. what also helps is when they load up on him, he has Kyrie who balled out also, but it's not just Kyrie. Again, the first half, the rest of the guys were 50% from 3. Mm -hmm. and it was only I think five or six threes that weren't hit by Luca or four threes, something that weren't hit by Luca, but that matters. Those are, those almost feel more painful than the Luca from the logo ones as these other ones where we're like, finally, it's not Luca. It's not Kyrie. Yeah. It's like a late contest to PJ Washington. Oh, you going to hit it too. Oh, Kleber got something for you too. It just felt like, and then they get the ball back on the other end. And it's just desperation and it feels uncomfortable and labored and cats attacking the basket. And again, they're forcing the ball. It felt like, and I know, I, I mean, Chris Finch is a good coach. I know that his plan was not get it to go bare at the nail and let <laughs> yeah, him make decisions. <laughs> and it felt like that was like, that was their counterpunch. Like they were shocked that they were going to trap, um, and, and Edwards at the top. And they're shocked that they're going to force the ball out of Edwards' hands. And like five times in a row, they passing the ball to Rudy at the nail. And Rudy up there getting freaky, trying to do skip passes and get aggressive. And all I was thinking was every shot that he makes is going to build some false confidence. And it is going to be a problem because Rudy going to think he's the go-to guy. He going head-to-head -head with Luka. But this was it just felt gross. And I'm sorry I'm rambling. Last thing I'll say is this is something we've talked about all playoffs for them is why does it seem like they don't have no other answers? And I'm hesitant, especially when we're talking about basketball, but any coaches in general, I'm hesitant to be like, make an adjustment, guy, when I don't know what the adjustment is. But make an adjustment, guy. Like, you know what they're going to do. They're going to double them. Why? And maybe this is this is him not hitting the shots or the uh, other guys not hitting shots, maybe his part or turning down shots. But it just is like we do the same thing every time, and it looks so gross. Dominique, you're literally the meme of the guy poking the person on the ground with a stick saying, do something, do yeah, something, anything, <laughs> anything, anything other than that. that does not involve Gobert being the decision maker, catching a ball on the run at the nail. Stop it. Yeah, I can already hear what people are going to say, because obviously Rudy at this point, um, because he's had a deep run in the playoffs and Rudy being Rudy, he's a master 
a hefty amount of haters and dissenters, uh, both online and real life. My real life friends text me about how much they hate Rudy Gobert. So it's not just, it's not just um, fake. Uh, it's not just nasty internet mob mentality stuff. It also seems like everyone on the court always hates him, too. <laughs> yeah, that, and that's what everybody's responding to. I think some people will say Chris Finch should have just been like, you know what, we can't score. We got to go to all offense lineups. Um, we got to try to spread this thing out. We got to try to make them pay for playing uh, Ant Edwards this way and just planting themselves in the paint. Four guys with their foot in the paint at all times. Like, there's got to be a way that we could try to do something different. It's just, how do you take out Carl Towns, a $60 million player, Rudy Gobert, a $45 million player, in your most crucial moment, right? Where you feel like the champ your, your um, uh, conference championship hopes are falling and slipping away. Like, it takes a lot of stones for a coach to do that so i'm not saying chris finch is a guy that doesn't have any i'm just saying this yeah. is the type of experience that might make him rejigger and do stuff yeah. different going forward uh next time in the playoffs yeah I, I i feel you i just imagine donovan mitchell watching this game uh with his hands <laughs> up like see i guarantee you the first text on Aunt edward's phone is donovan mitchell like i told you bro i told you how many times do you think he sent the the Leonardo DiCaprio meme from Once Upon a Time, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, <laughs> pointing at the screen? Oh yeah, literally that. Um, so uh, yeah, and the other thing about the sub, so like I feel bad about do something. I just wish that they had some sort of offensive action that anticipated what they were going to see. But I will uh, defend Chris Fitch a little bit when it's like take them guys out for who? Like Nas yeah. Reed is a is a poor man's Carl Anthony Town. <laughs> sure, but that's not. That's not going to fix anything. Who are you going to put in for Gobert? Like, it's not like they just are replete with offensive weapons on the bench. Yeah, and it's not, look, to be clear, like, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, Jaden McDaniels, these guys are not dead-eye shooters. These guys are not mm -hmm. going to have the Mavericks defense quivering in their boots because, you know, they, they left them alone for two seconds and allowed them to get a spot up. Like, that's not the type of team that was constructed. And, you know, the problem for them is that they could – and. When we say it's a matchup league against Denver, they could exploit Denver's problems with interior defense. Um, their size, Ant's ability to, you know, get to the cup against guys like Caldwell Pope, who, who don't really have the heft to deal with him. They could exploit what, you know, um, what Denver was lacking in. That was a nice little matchup for them. It, Dallas, that wasn't the case. <laughs> Gafford and Lively, these guys are monsters in the paint. Yeah. And it, it, like, it, if, even when they're not swatting stuff into the heavens, guys are just straight up not going in there to take the shot. That's what's happening with slow mo when he gets the ball in the corner wide open. And not only does he not take the shot, he doesn't even attack the closeout because he's like, what am I going to do in the paint? Right. And so that's what I think they ultimately ran into. Man, Lively was so impressive with the passing also. It's so nice mm -hmm. that you can dump him the ball and he'll make that extra pass into the corner for a three. Even if it's not a three, it's like it starts the action again with the with the hard closeout. Um, guys, I do want to push this forward. We should talk a tiny bit Mavs Celtics and oh, T-Wolves yeah. future. What do you th first first impressions of Mavs Celtics, NBA Finals, really interesting where – you're going to go into a series where the Celtics have won 64 games, rolled through the playoffs, but Luka is probably going to be the best player in the series. Definitely How do you think, going to be the best player in the series. Yeah. First impressions of that matchup. I just love the storylines, right? Uh, just mm -hmm. the, the NBA had in me, the Kyrie going back to Boston with the Sage. Uh, Chris Stapps back to Dallas after they spurned him and basically – Basically for not being able to be as good as Kyrie has been as a two-man, yeah. right? That's essentially what he got traded for. It's just like, bro, you couldn't back down Patrick Beverly in a playoff series. Like, we got to get you the hell up out of here, right? Uh, th that I love the Tatum and Luka storyline where there's always been this talk about, well, why is Luka getting all this MVP bus when Tatum's on a team that's winning all these games and has this point of virtual and blah, blah, blah. So I love that sort of um, storyline. I just love J. Kidd uh, as a coach who I think, uh, sorry, Joe Mazzulla is severely outmatched um, in terms of coaching acumen. I just think there's so many dope and cool storylines. It's just Boston's, you know, just – pushing the rock up the mountain again and again and again and again. And for as young as this team is, man, if they can't beat the Mavericks, 
It's like I was told this was the 27 Yankees before the season started. If they can't beat the Mavericks, come on now. The Celtics the team that I picked to win. I don't feel all that confident about it now. Um I think coming off of that game that we just watched and getting ready for the game that we're about to see, I'm reminded that whatever I thought about defense doesn't matter in basketball. Is like <laughs> offensive guys get paid for a reason. No, I, I'm being Hell serious. Yeah. Like the yeah. defense the matters. Defensive teams in the NBA in the finals. No, but that's that's not the point that I'm making. The point that I'm making is that the offensive guys really matter. They get paid more, and you guys both, without question, said Luke is going to be the best oh, player yeah. in this series. Mm-hmm. When it's clear that we all would agree that Tatum's a better, significantly better defensive player, sure. and like uh a worse offensive player but not much worse and so like normally you would be Uh, like well i don't know man all right anyway the point that i'm making is guys that there is no right there is no good defense for that (laughs) require Mm -hmm. you to compromise yourself are the guys that matter and the mavs got two of them and yeah the Celtics, maybe their big team defense and team offense, and everybody can shoot and everybody play can play uh, just about everywhere. Maybe that's going to be present a problem. But they don't got they don't got got Kyrie and Luca are better at getting their own shot than anybody on their whole roster. So I think a couple of things are important, right? Um, Luca and what's funny to me is that for once, like a prominent player saying that he needed something on his team and he was actually right. Like I, I'm reminded of LeBron being like, I need a secondary handler. I'm tired of handling the ball all the time. Get me Russell Westbrook. And w- it was a complete and utter disaster and he was wrong. But Luca for years has been saying, I need a lob threat. This is going to unlock our offense in a way that I'm telling you, once we get one of these kind of guys in here, it's over. And Having that lob threat, that action off of the pick and roll where it's just like Luka gets a guy on his back and there's absolutely nothing you can do and the big man is now basically put in peril. And then if you try to devote resources from elsewhere to stopping that action, Luka's ability to spray out and there's guys that could take and make big old shots. Like, I, 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 I... the team around him is constructed for it to work, is what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. Um, whether the Boston yeah. Celtics play competent defense or not. And then the Mavs were a top four defense after the All-Star break, meaning after they traded for um, Gafford, after they traded for P.J. Washington, after they put Derek Lively Jr. in the starting lineup, um, they became one of the best defenses in basketball. And now they've got Luka and Kyrie, and they're flanked by an incredibly elite defense. And Jason Kidd is coaching the hell out of them defensively. Um, I I think this is going to be a whale of a series. Yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting. And so for me... That there are two two sort of things that I think this is going to be incredibly interesting to watch, which is one like Boston. I think matches up well with all of these guys. Like they have they have someone to throw at every person on the maps. They have, it's wait it who do they have to throw at Luca? <laughs> I mean, no one can really guard Luca, but they have big, powerful wings that can yeah. at, at least it, are a physical matchup. <laughs> but I think for 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 me, the interesting thing is like, are we going to get? at least four a plus games from Kyrie and Luca together. Cause to like, that's, that's a cheat code in the NBA. When two guys are that dominant offensively and are that great shot makers, you just throw your hands up and say, all right, whatever. Um, and that's like, that is distinctly on the table with the team playing this well at this point of the season. The Celtics are two and oh this year against the Mavs and the Mavs in those games, both Luca and Kyrie played Porzingis missed one of those games. I'm not sure how helpful that is for the prediction going forward, but uh, I do think that it, it kind of feels like what you were, the point that you were just making, Charlie, is it kind of feels like the games that the Mavs are going to win are going to be because going to be because Luca or Kyrie or both of them just can't miss that day. And there's no they defense both to stop that. Right. They need oh. both of them in those games against the Celtics is what I honestly think. Yeah. That team is really complete. Like they're going to need those guys going off in, in, a, in a game, both of them. I don't think the Celtics are some impossible team to guard. I, I just don't, um, especially yeah. from the best defenses. And so I'm not convinced that these guys have to drop 30 a game in order to win the series. I think they're going to, mm. I think they're going to be able to play pretty well on defense 
against them. I'm not saying they're going to completely shut their water off and make them look like the Knicks or something like that by the time the Knicks had all of their injuries. I'm not saying that, but I think they can get to a competent enough level on defense where Luka just being close to his standard will be able to get some some nice wins. I really I really think this is going to be a hyper competitive yeah. series. And again, before the playoffs, absolutely nobody thought the Dallas Mavericks were going to end up in the NBA Finals. And, yo, they were pretty dominant against OKC, and they dominated mm -hmm. the Wolves. By the time the OKC series was over, they were just kicking their ass up and down the court. And so I, I, I don't see how we should just be able to doubt them and yeah. cast them off because Boston won 64 games. That great defense of the Celtics couldn't seem to corral Nimhard last series, but I guess <laughs> they, they, they may they may have a different game plan for Luca and Kyrie. Maybe that's part of it, but they they were having trouble chasing around my man Nimby. We've been throwing around Michael Jordan comparisons a lot this postseason. Why not throw Andrew Nemhard in the mix? Listen, I mean, why not? Man, listen, Michael he, Jeffrey he Jordan. He might not be Michael he Jordan, but him. he might have took, you know, Ben Matherin's spot. Like, that was – he's yeah. a higher pedigree, higher drafted guy, and Nemhard went in there and showed that he's a playoff caliber player somehow. So, yeah. shouts to him, even if he's not Jordan. He might be Randy Brown or something, y'all. Made him some money, but I, I, <laughs> I, yeah, I know, I know that we've made it to the end of this chat when we are doing Nimhard conversation. So uh, we do have uh, Legler on the other side helping us preview the Celtics. Let's get to that. Thanks a lot, Was. Peace, y'all. All right, welcome back. And as promised, we are joined once again for a second week in a row by the great Tim Legler. Um, and I'm not just blowing smoke. He is incredibly great. My phone got bombarded last week by people saying, damn, Tim really helped your show. I was like, I mean, we're pretty good. Like, our analysis isn't, isn't regular <laughs> level, but it ain't that bad. But uh, lessons learned. I'm going to get out of the way and let uh, Tim educate us once again. And I will be recycling these takes as if they're my own going forward, Tim. So, uh, Charlie, that's what do you want to start day, with? Man. I do it for you all the time when I'm having football conversations. Uh, so don't worry about well, it. That's, that's what friends are for. So, yeah, I think we should do a Celtics deep dive. Like, they are in the NBA Finals. They are 12-2 and two in the playoffs so far. They just swept the Indiana Pacers. The key stat from that sweep, though, the Pacers had a 90% win probability in the fourth quarter of three of the four games, according to ESPN stats and info. They lost all of those games. And so, based on the Celtics' results, you think of them as this dominant team, based on watching it, are you more or less confident in the Celtics after how they performed in that sweep of the Pacers? I'm more confident in them than I was, truthfully. And I know people, like sometimes I get kind of amazed with, with where narratives go mm -hmm. with teams. And I agreed, there were some guys missing in the Eastern Conference playoffs. We get it, understand that. They, By the way, they they got a big piece missing yeah. too, which, which people seem to leave that out that part out of the conversation. They're missing an enormous part of what they do in Chris Tapp's Porzingis. So they're missing something, too. The thing with the Celtics that you always questioned was, for me, two things. One, are they going to have too many possessions in the game that they make themselves easy to guard because they're of their, their taste for that early three-point shot, which mm -hmm. is what teams want them to take? Now, look, don't get me wrong. Some nights they bury you under an avalanche of that, and you don't come back from that. But I do think when they're more intent on reversing the ball and having somebody get both feet in the paint off the dribble before they hunt a three, that's when they become almost impossible to guard. But they go through stretches of games where they let you guard them. So that was the one question I had. And the other one was, how are they going to perform in those moments when they have some adversity? And particularly the fourth quarter, when shot making now is at a premium and it's been a question mark about some of these guys in the past. That's what I needed to see answered, and I felt like they did it. They didn't face a lot of adversity in the first two rounds, but but they did lose game two at home in both rounds. And they answered that by going on the road in game three and just snuffing this out. Like, no, we're not going to let this build at all to any level of crazy talk back in Boston sports talk radio. We're going to end this right now in game three. We're going to end the rebellion. Boom, and they did it, both series. And in this round, obviously, these games, you know, Indiana contributed to it. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. They, they absolutely did, but it's one thing – to have the door cracked open, it's another thing to kick it down when you get the chance. And that's what they did repeatedly to the Indiana Pacers. So I, for me, that series was much more about what I learned 
was about Boston playing in under pressure, and I just think it was more about Indiana being a much better team than people thought. That's a really good team, a really hard team to guard, and they showed that, and they think they earned a lot of people's respect. For Boston, it was about, are you going to handle these moments well? Are you going to have your top guys make shots when you have to have it? Because you're definitely going to face that in the finals. And they did. So for me, I have more faith in them based on what I've seen to this point. You got to be an active listener with Legler. I, I'm sorry if I go to my computer. It's not because I'm ignoring you. It's because I'm taking notes. There are a number of different things. Because after we talked to you last time, it had me looking for specific things in the game. It made the game more enjoyable. And so I, one of the things that jumped out to me in there is like the, the feet in the paint and paint touches and those sorts of things. Like I, I watch games and I say, this is good offense or this is bad offense and not – know what the spark is every time but that's one thing that i'll be looking for going forward but there is a question that i have based on the things that you said in this series it's funny because we find different ways to criticize the celtics or criticize any team and the the prevailing criticism of the celtics coming into the playoffs was they're a dominant team but if you get them in a tight situation a clutch moment they have shown that they can't do that it seems like they showed that the exact opposite in this series. So do you think the questions around that was overblown or do you think that they answered them or they've grown? Like how are you interpreting the the Celtics clutch performance going into the finals? No, I think they've grown in that way. And look, you make a great point about that because that has been a legitimate question. And to be fair, that is also some of that is the carryover from the finals they lost to the Golden State Warriors. Mm-hmm. Because that was a that was a problem in that series, particularly for Jason Tatum. And so as a result, and they've been to the conference finals so many times without breaking through except for that one year. And then that's what happens to them in the finals. And Jason Tatum, who was an MVP candidate that year, first-team All-League player, is outplayed by the Warriors' best player. And Wiggins actually battled Tatum not to a standstill. Tatum still had a slight statistical advantage, but Wiggins was incredible in guarding him in that series and like representing a legitimate challenge to him where it made everybody kind of rethink Like, what is Jason Tatum ultimately going to be for you? So there was some of that weight was carried ever since uh, up until this point. And you wanted to see when are they going to be tested and what's their response going to be? Again, they weren't tested a lot in the first two rounds. They were certainly tested in this series. And you look at the way that they played. And and look, Tatum had some big moments. Mm -hmm. You know, people criticized him at the end of the game, you know, when Indiana turned the ball over eight seconds to go and and Jalen Brown forces the overtime. And they criticized Tatum for the way he played down the stretch of regulation. And I'm going, why are you focused on that when the dude made a three and a three-point play in overtime that basically won the game? <laughs> like, But you're still hanging up on these possessions because I think people, their mind immediately wants to go there when they see any sort of that. And for me, I thought he played well in the Indiana series when he had to. But more importantly, it's the way Jalen Brown played. Mm-hmm. Because now you have a star and a co-star. This is no longer clear-cut option one and then definite number two. Because when you, if that's the case, when your number one wavers and struggles is you're too good enough to elevate to that level. They're not one and two anymore. These guys are co-stars. And if you look at not just if the fact that Jalen Brown got the Eastern Conference Finals MVP, it's the fact that for the last two months of the season, Jalen Brown went toe-to-toe with Jason Tatum in terms of who is the alpha of this offense. So now you have two guys that have that ability to win any matchup in front of them and a lot more faith in Jalen Brown. To me, it's the best thing in the world that happened to Jason Tatum was the emergence of Jalen Brown this season and in this postseason and getting the conference finals MVP because that means Jason Tatum has more margin for error, which is going to put less pressure on him, which means he's more likely to play well when he has to. You've been incredibly optimistic about all of the Celtics things, and I think it's fair because it's in opposition to a lot of how people have been treating him despite the way that they've succeeded. But I want to know if there are fair criticisms of Jason Tatum. Are there any criticisms of his game that you think are fair and accurate? I think the biggest criticism of Jason Tatum that is fair and accurate is his propensity to take a very difficult perimeter shot in a big spot Mm -hmm. at times to bail you out defensively because he's got, he's got the handle. He added a counter move with his handle that he didn't have first few years of his career. He's got counters now. So you make one move, cut him off. He can back up, reset, change directions, go to a secondary dribble move and still get to his spot. He couldn't do that earlier in his career. So he's added that. He could, so he means that he can win just about any one-on-one. 
against anybody and get to a shot that's more advantageous for him. And I think there are times it's fair. I think because he can get it off whenever he wants at six, eight, six, nine, you know, whatever they list, six, ten, whatever he really is. He's long. When you stand next to him, you're actually surprised at how tall he is. So whatever the height that he actually is, and he's got a hot, very high release. Mm-hmm. You're not much you can do to stop a guy like that if he's got a good enough handle to get to a spot. But I think that feeling of, boom, I want to end it now, hit that home run, like right here, right now, I think that still kind of it, it, it permeates him and his DNA that he can help you defensively. And that's I think that is a fair criticism. The one thing, though, I will say about him real quick, he doesn't – like I look at his numbers in the playoffs in the last five years. And he gets beat up a lot, and I'm going, wait a second. He does have five consecutive years. He's averaged 25 points a game in the postseason. Yeah. Three of those years, by the way, he's averaged more than 10 rebounds a game. And that is a monster number for a small forward. So he's helping you out on the boards, and which that's a big part of your team defense, is being able to clean up the glass and give teams one shot. He finishes, and he, he guards whoever he has to and supposed to. He doesn't run from a challenge. They don't protect him. They don't hide him. He guards who he has to guard, and he finishes off the possession by going and getting a defensive rebound. So he does some of the tougher things because I don't think people look at him as a tough guy. Right. Mm-hmm. I, and they look at him maybe as, 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 as being a guy that you can physically kind of get into and manipulate a little bit and, and get, get him back on his heels. I think there's more of a toughness to Jason Tatum than he's given credit for. Right. And his numbers – Really good. There's a lot of teams in this league that would kill to have a guy that's been that consistent with his scoring and rebounding in the playoffs for the last five years. But look, the bottom line is this. He's got to ring the bell now. This is the moment in Jason Tatum's career. I've... Bell has to be rung. Call has to be answered. However you want, whatever, <laughs> whatever, whatever, yeah. you know, cliche you want to use. Jason Tatum needs to do that in this series. He needs because first of all, they're going to need it to win. No matter who they play. I have to be honest, is I'm a bit guilty of this also, that it feels like we uh we can we can uh describe Jason Tatum in different ways, no matter how he acts, is like call him soft because he's not bo- boisterous, but if he hits a big shot, then he is clutch and cool. It's like he hasn't <laughs> right. changed. It's just we decide what narrative right. we want to frame uh Jason Tatum with. It's very true. And he's 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 not he's not like super demonstrative on the court. Yeah. He's very calm, cool, and collected. That's his demeanor. That's who he is. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a lot of teams that kind of appreciate that because it gives you stability, temperamental stability right. from your best player. And there are teams that lack that in this league. He gives you that. Yeah. But I think, listen, here's what, here's what they did. They went out and they surrounded him with a team mm-hmm. that takes pressure off of him having to be great for them to still win. And I think ultimately that's a big deal for him mentally to know that. It's not about him having to go get 35 right. every night in the playoffs and or in the finals to win a championship. That burden is not on him, and that actually is going to make it a little bit easier for him, even though it might come at the expense of a finals MVP. It might come at – it certainly already did come at the expense yeah, of a conference he can, finals He can worry MVP. about that later. He has the Steph Curry no problem. Doubt. Go ahead and get you, you got a, that right, a, a man. finals at your fourth championship. So true. Look, they don't want to check those boxes. They <laughs> yeah. don't want to just these guys on his level. They don't want to just win a title. Yeah, you got to get a league they, they, MVP. They, you got to get a that's finals it, MVP. Man. You, yeah. need, you want that too, and that's the thing. Like for for him now, with as many times as they've come close uh, here, yeah. like you know, he's just like I don't care what happens, man. You give it. You give. You get Payne Pritchard finals MVP. <laughs> I don't care. I just want to win a championship, and I'll worry about right, that if, later. Payne Pritchard gets the MVP. I'm going to demand a recount. <laughs> <laughs> what you got, Charles? Deal. So that's actually so th- this is something I think is really interesting. This is, I mean, it's a bit of a narrative question, but I think a lot of people, it seems like they've interpreted the development of having two number ones or having this loaded team as a negative because they're they're using against Jason Tatum, being like he's not the one A on his team yeah. every single night. No doubt. So you think that's that's definitely a good thing for them for the pecking order of their offense going into the one hundred percent. It's the it's an incredible thing at 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 the expense of some personal recognition and accolades, and that's why that's another thing. Like sometimes you got to give guys credit for that too, embracing that. Like he understood, and I'm not saying you're going to run in there and throw a tantrum. No, we're bringing in Porzingis and Holiday. We're better. No, now I'm not going to get enough credit. He's not going to act like that. But I'm just saying, think about it. Like mm-hmm. if I had said to you prior to this year, if I had said to you. Any of the previous years of Jason Tatum's career. If the Boston Celtics win a championship, 
Jason Tatum is going to be the finals MVP. Right. It'd yeah. be incomprehensible to yeah. think that it would be somebody else because you're thinking to yourself, well, if he doesn't play on that level, they can't win anyway. So those two things don't even go together, right? That's not the case anymore. Now it is conceivable that he doesn't win finals MVP and they, they win a championship. And I think that is a good thing for the Celtics and ultimately a good thing for him because it means he is more likely to be a champion. And that is the thing that we've been questioning about him. I, I'm obviously scared to push back on you in any way because you know more about basketball than me. But I'm going to gather, I'm gonna gather my courage and say they are not true peers. Like, no matter how well Jalen Brown plays, there's one thing that I've always been told about basketball players is – the 1A guy knows who he is, and he's going to get the ball in the final seconds to put the game away, to make the decisions. And I still think that's Jason Tatum. And no matter how cool Jason Tatum is, if that no longer becomes him, we might be introduced to a different side of Jason Tatum. And I don't know one way or the other, but I do think that I think there will always – I do believe that there will always be – 1A and 1B because two guys can't get the ball on the final possession. Listen, that's a whole separate conversation. Because, look, no, no matter how Jason Tatum plays on a given night, mm -hmm. you're probably right. They're mm -hmm. coming out of a timeout with 18 seconds left in a one-possession game, and it's critical possession. You're probably right. Jason Tatum's going to be involved in that action as the primary guy. Although I've seen games this year when he wasn't mm -hmm. necessarily, and I saw games last year in the playoffs – and actually, Missoula got crushed for this because they were, they came out of a timeout, a big moment in the Philly series, and they threw a direct entry pass to the post for Marcus Smart. And Jason Tatum was on the weak side of the floor with his hands in his pocket. And he got crushed for that. So I, it, I've seen it happen, but that's a different conversation. Yeah. Because, yeah, at some point, the re, in a moment in the game, you have to have that delineation. Mm -hmm. Like okay, and, and I think I do still think Jason Tatum is that, but that doesn't necessarily mean – that he would have to be the finals MVP right. yeah, to, to come through in that moment or not. Because who knows what happened to it prior in the game. There might be a situation where Jalen Brown's got 34 yeah. points. I mean, Jason he did. Jalen Brown did hit the points. tying shot, that three-pointer to send him to the overtime. He's the one to hit that shot. But I think – Exactly. Yeah. You brought up Joe Missoula. Is there any nerves? Like, you're generally very, very positive guy. I don't know how I feel about Joe Missoula in these situations. I think he's actually gotten better through the course of – the season in the course of the playoffs, but is there any concern about Joe Missoula in these finals? There, Look, there still is, but it's definitely significantly less than last year mm -hmm. going into the postseason. And if you think about what he, what this guy went through last year, but you get a team handed to you right before the season, and it's not like, okay, this is your first head coaching experience, youngest guy in the league, and you're yeah. like, okay, well, the, great, I can just dip my toe in the water, right? Where It don't matter, results don't matter. Oh, no, 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 you're expected to win it all. <laughs> um, you know, let's not get things messed up here. I know we just gave you the team because he made you Doka situation and right. <laughs> literally right before the season. So now he's like, okay, so and, and you're, you're at that point, you're on the fly, man. Like so much of what they did last year was a carryover from the year before on mm -hmm. both ends of the floor. Schematically, you, he didn't even get had a chance to have a real imprint. That's more this year. And they had 64 wins. Now they added more talent. People expected them to be the, you know, the best team in the, in the East, if not the best team in the NBA. So, yeah, that helps. But I feel less often when I watch the Celtics play this season and the postseason, do I have questions that arise in my mind? I don't know if I'd have done that. Like, what are they doing right there? What are they running? You, you know, sometimes he's still a very young guy. He'll be much better at this two, three years from now than he is now. But I have, I have a lot less. And I know Boston fans, more importantly, I think have less anxiety about that than they did last year going into the playoffs. So a lot of the conversation about Boston has been about their offense and about, you know, settling for jump shots, whatever. Are we sort of underrating their defense? Like when I watch playoff basketball, sometimes it's you're looking for soft spots. You're looking for places of comfort for a team's offense. And it just doesn't seem like there is one when you play the Celtics defense. Has that been lost because of the path to the finals, because of the questions about them being a jump shooting team, et cetera, et cetera? I actually think it's been lost more because this is a prolific offensive team mm. and a lot of nights they kind of can cruise and then hit you with a with this blast offensively where they string together. You know, I remember I called a game on radio, Knicks Celtics late in the year in Madison Square Garden, really good game in the first half. Celtics made nine threes in the third quarter, game over. Everybody headed, headed home. Damn. And that's what they can do to teams. So as a result, 
Their top flight state of readiness defensively is not there all the time. They absolutely have the ability to be on par with Minnesota, with Dallas, who I think are the two best defensive teams, probably going into the playoffs, they were the two best, and now here they are in the conference finals playing. Uh, they're on par with that, but not not for the extent of the game that mm -hmm. those two teams are. They'll pick their spots when they have to clamp down. Here's what's really unique about them. This is an incredible number. This was late in the year, and it might have been might have been before that game when I got this information, the game that I called, which is in March. To that point in the year, their lineup with Porzingis included, those five guys, Holiday White, Tatum Brown, and Porzingis, had blitzed ball screens, meaning trap a, mm -hmm. a, a ball handler coming off a screen, five times the entire season. <laughs> and the reason for that is their switchability yep. is unlike any other team in the NBA with those five guys because both their guards have good size, they've got good strength, they've got good lateral movement, and then their forwards – Jalen Brown is built like a tank, so he can guard bigger guys. Tatum can guard smaller guys because of his reach and his lateral quickness. And then you've got Porzingis, who can switch back off of a guard and at 7'3", still stay up enough to bother them. Or he's quick enough to track a guy to the rim if they turn the corner on him and beat that thing up on the backboard. So they have this unique personnel package with those five players where they can switch more things than any team in the league and not get hurt. And they'll do that when they have to do it and really get into you and clamp down and need four minutes of defense right here. Boom, there it is. But there's a lot of times they're up and down, man, in this track meet where they're just putting up numbers and outscoring you, knowing that you can't keep up with this firepower. So I just don't think their mentality is come out from the beginning and turn this into a bar fight. And I think Minnesota is more likely to do that. Dallas does that a little bit more. I don't necessarily – and the Knicks do that. I don't think that Boston does that as much. But when you watch them at their peak level, they're every bit as good as those teams. Porzingis is their big offseason acquisition. And, and I Drew. Guess Drew Hall I mean, Drew. yeah, Drew Holiday was kind of a, a throw-in to facilitate another deal. He's ended up being a really big positive, but I don't think yeah. that they would say, like, Drew was our big offseason. But anyway, the point I was going to make is – or the question I was going to ask is – you named a bunch of things that Porzingis does for this team. Which one of those things do you think is, like, the most valuable? Is it his switchability, his rim protection, his shooting that opens that space of the floor, or something else that I haven't mentioned? I must say his spacing with, okay. with his shooting, and here's why. So you look at what they lost with uh, Marcus Smart, Robert Williams. Those are the two best defensive players. Robert Williams uh, was the guy that was making the spectacular block, protecting the paint. Porzingis is a little bit better out on the perimeter because he can play off guys and put his hand up. But the, but defensively, the impact is very similar. Mm -hmm. okay. Marcus Smart, Holiday, I'd say the same thing. The impact is similar defensively. Holiday's a much better offensive player, much more consistently good offensive player. Here's where Porzingis differentiates himself completely. He spaces mm -hmm. not at 24 feet, which is where you're going to see Al Horford. Mm -hmm. Al Horford is going to be towed up at the line. And why, why I say that matters as opposed to 28 feet where Porzingis stands, that's a big difference when you're trying to help on the mm -hmm. ball handler yeah. and recover back to the shooter. You can get back to Al Horford a little bit easier because he's closer to you because he doesn't have the range that Porzingis does. Porzingis, I've seen, he even goes out to 30 feet sometimes. You're not getting back to that. So the threat of that means, number one, either he's going to get a clean shot from there and he's a very good three-point shooter, or it means you're going to have to now commit another defender on the opposite side of the floor to make that rotation to him, which means one more pass, somebody is towing up a corner three-point shot wide open. You're less likely to give that up with Al Horford because the distances with which he is spacing the floor aren't as great, so your defense can stay more connected with your rotations. Porzingis is a real problem with the distances he's shooting the ball from. Do they need him to come back and be effective to win the finals? I think so. Yeah, I do. I, I believe they do because I think that you're going to get challenged. You're going to get challenged in the paint in a way uh, that you haven't to this point. It's that simple. You're going to need his length around the rim, whether that's Luca in there a lot, the lob threat that their two centers represent. You know, Kyrie, we know, finishes a lot of stuff in there. Um, the lobs to Jones, you know, they're, they're attacking the paint. Minnesota, obviously, they play. They have three bigs mm -hmm. that play for them. And they've got Anthony Edwards attacking off the dribble. So you're going to need that length and size. And a guy, listen, by the way, in his entire career, 
Christos Porzingis has been one of the top 10 rim protectors in the league year after year after year. This isn't anything new. It's what he's done. Yeah. So you need that big time in the next round. You, you've you been able to survive it to this point because it hasn't been a huge threat for you. Even Indiana, their center mostly is on the perimeter shooting threes. Um, you know, the first two rounds, they weren't really going to be challenged in that way. So this is different in the finals. They're going to need Porzingis. Last question. I have to go full sports media on this one. Um, I, I have to. I mean, this team has been to six conference finals, two finals. They've been hyped since Jason Tatum was 19. Like, I not even the joke. Like, can, I guess, can I guess your question? Is this team yeah. is this team the yeah. Buffalo Bills of the early nineties if they don't win if they Surprise don't win the finals? <laughs> man, oh man, oh man. That's a that's a that's a tough comparison. I thought you were gonna go, um, is this season a disappointment or is this a failure? Should I, they should they blow it up? I didn't right, think so you were gonna go cross sport and out. Artistic yeah, yeah, yeah. flourish. Look, I like it. I hear you. I, I I hear what you're saying. I don't think they'd be on that level. Yeah. But I will say this. This this team not winning a championship yeah. absolutely is a failure this year. Mm-hmm. And now and people, it's weird to me, like, like, especially when you're dealing with Celtics fans sometimes, because they, on one hand, if you say a team even can compete with them for a half <laughs> of a upset. game, they're insulted by that. Right. <laughs> but then when you say, well, if they don't win a championship, it's a failure. Then they want to pull the, They want to <laughs> pull all the pressure off of them. I'm like, well, you can't have it yeah. both ways. If nobody's worthy of playing them, then winning a championship should be the final result. Right. Here's why I say it's a failure because every year in which you add, you add this kind of talent. It's year one right now. The windows in the NBA are very yeah. tight. This window's lasted a long time because of Tatum and Brown being there the whole time. But th- with this particular group, adding Holiday and Porzingis, it's year one, man. Win it all. And every year, by the way, that you have those guys all together, it's win it all or it's a failure. Yes, I do believe that. Just like I believe Milwaukee not winning a championship this year is a failure when you pair Lillard with uh, Antetokounmpo. If you don't end up with a championship, that was their expectations right. when they did it. So for me, that's I view it differently. Yes, it's a failure. I wouldn't say that about Oklahoma City. Mm-hmm. I probably wouldn't say that about Dallas right now. I wouldn't say that about Minnesota. But about Boston, yeah, I would say that. About Milwaukee, yes, I would say that. Because that was absolutely their expectation. Going into the season was win a championship, both of those teams. And clearly Boston winning 64 games and lapping the rest of the East. Yes, you should end up expecting a parade. And if you don't get one, something went wrong. All right, Tim. Thank you so, so much from whatever hotel you're in right now for making time for us once again. I uh, appreciate all the insight and also like you making me feel better about my Celtics pick. I picked them to win the championship before the playoffs <laughs> and they've been making me nervous. But now, fully confident. Fully confident because Tim made me feel better. Thanks, buddy. My pleasure, guys. Yep. Anytime. All right. That's been another fantastic episode of Diamond Dick Fox Show. Thank you so much. Download, rate, review, and subscribe. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Charlie, for your great contributions as my co host and the great producers, Serafina, Megan, Brian, Kevin, and Tez. And we out. I love you, Paul. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show.